I'm Brian Fowler, president of Blind Creek Resources Limited, listed on the TSX Venture Exchange, ticker symbol BCK. Blind Creek is focused in the Yukon, Northwest Territories, and British Columbia. The company's key property is the Blend Project, one of the largest undeveloped lead-zinc silver deposits in Western Canada, plus plans to advance the recently acquired, fully permitted historic engineer gold mine in the Atlant District of Northwestern BC. Check us out at blindcreekresources.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ted Dixon, CEO and co-founder of InkResearch.ca, Canada's first online financial news and research service. His website, CanadianInsider.com. Welcome back to the show, Ted. Oh, thanks for having me back, Jim. Has the Bank of Canada finally changed its tone about what's happening with the Canadian economy? Well, as your listeners uh, may recall, you know we've been talking on this very show about how the Canadian economy is doing much better than the Bank of Canada and the consensus uh, have uh, recognized. And we talked about how last November, how Canadian insiders in our in Canadian Insider Index rebalancing shifted towards a pro-growth, pro-Canada position. And that has played out and the Bank of Canada has begrudgingly thrown in the towel on its perma pessimism, you know, which was really cover for Stephen Polo's, I believe, to try and talk down the Canadian dollar, uh, you know, as far as he could get it, uh, in an attempt to prop up, uh, the export, uh, sector. So that game is now coming to an end because the Bank of Canada just doesn't have any credibility, uh, what, what little it has left with the mainstream media, uh, was at risk of dissipating if they kept up pounding the uh, the crisis drum that Canada is still in a crisis mode when the economy is outperforming the U.S. economy and when, you know, it's very hard for even the perma bears to find something, you know, wrong with the Canadian uh, labor market. You know, I keep hearing about how the Can- Canada wages aren't, aren't very strong. Well, in the GDP report, actually, the wages are basically double what the Stats Canada uh, survey reports say. So there is evidence that wages are picking up in Canada, employment's picking up in Canada, growth is stronger in Canada than the U.S. I mean, this, you know, some Canadians just don't believe that, but those are the facts. And, you know, the, so the central bank can only play it, uh, the, you know, the sky is falling uh, melody for so long uh, before, you know, everyone kind of catches on to the to the game that they're up to, and that game has been to drive down the Canadian dollar to benefit a few exporters. One of my analysts said if the Canadian dollar can somehow hit 78 cents, he believes it could hit 84. Well, it's undervalued right now in terms of, I believe, you know, Canadian fundamentals, particularly our labor force, which is very strong. Canadians, uh, I think... Really, uh, you know, sell their, their, themselves short a little bit in terms of what we offer the world on a competitive basis in terms of our labor force. We have a very strong, uh, labor force in terms of its knowledge. Now, we're not the most productive, uh, but it's been very hard, uh, for any industrial economy to remain productive, uh, since the financial crisis. And, you know, we've had a central bank that's had a, basically a war on, uh, capital investment by trying to lower interest rates to the point where everything is being flooded into real estate. Well, you don't build a productive economy by pushing all your uh, investment into the real estate industry. You know, you want real estate to be reflective of a productive economy. You don't build a productive economy by pushing all your resources into real estate. Now, you know, that being said, from the uh, in terms of the human capital element of our workforce, it's very strong. I mean, Canadians themselves have invested heavily in education. Provincial governments, you know, uh, have a nice competition going, I think, to see, you know, which provinces can have the best education system. And that seems to work. I mean, we've got Canada scoring very well on international high schools uh, metrics. And, you know, for example, British Columbia is one of the strongest in the world. So we've got a lot going for us in Canada, and it doesn't deserve, you know, a 60-cent dollar, which is what I think the Bank of Canada was trying to engineer. And it just wasn't paying off. You know, they we we had a survey out this morning from Stats Canada 
on manufacturing, and we're at the new record highs. But I, that's that's good news. It is good news. But I hate to break this to Stephen Polos. You know, it was led by the resource industry and the energy area, manufacturing industry, energy area. So, you know, this whole approach by the Bank of Canada to try and manipulate the economy into non-energy exports by driving down the Canadian dollar, fortunately, it's it's coming to an end because it's been a failure in terms of their objectives. But uh, fortunately, the Canadian economy is strong enough by just by the sheer brute force of the uh, workforce of, in our country and the high capital, uh, high human capital that exists in Canada. You know, uh, the Canadian dollar hasn't plummeted to the levels that I think the Bank of Canada was trying to drive it to. And I say bravo for Canadians. It's a triumph of individual Canadians over a central uh, bank that really has demonstrated, uh, I think, policy recklessness uh, over the last four years. Has it helped the Canadian dollar that it seems this year Canadians are staying home perhaps to celebrate birthday 150 instead of going to the U.S.? Well, certainly, you know, the low dollar has discouraged people from going uh, abroad. And and, and uh, while that may sound nice, I mean, why should we as Canadians uh, be penalized, you know, for where we want to take our vacation, whether it's Canada 150 or not? So, yeah, it, no, it's 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 excellent that, uh, you know, that the, the, the Canadians are going to celebrate uh, the 150 and bravo, but uh, Canadians should have the choice uh, to be able to uh, celebrate uh, somewhere the way they want to celebrate it. After all, we only get so many weeks a year in holidays, and uh, we want to take them where we, you know, where we can, um, you know, where, where we want to go, and um, we don't want a central bank having to make, I mean, trying to make those decisions for us. So, thank you, Mr. Polos, but uh, uh, we would like to see, uh, you know, a, a stronger dollar to not only encourage um, capital investment in uh, equipment and uh, computers and like that you have to buy abroad, but also so that Canadians, when they want to take their holiday, they can pick uh, the destination that they want to go to, not where the central bank based in Ottawa wants us to go to. We'll have more with Ted Dixon right after the break. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc., listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome back. We're talking with Ted Dixon. Ted, I just saw a crawl on the business news screen saying that the Toronto Stock Exchange is now below water for the first time this year. Well, it's below water. It's underwater. And it's also uh, dipped below uh, some key trend lines, which uh, we t- talk about actually on CanadianInsider.com, which your listeners can go to and uh, download our latest uh, uh, market report uh, for free. You can uh, go to the website, and there's a free report uh, available uh, on the website and a PDF uh, for those who have registered uh, on the on the um, on the website, which is free. And it's titled as a Canadian Summer Stock Breakdown Unavoidable. Unfortunately, uh, the uh, S and P TSX Composite and the Canadian Insider Index are both trading below their 150-day moving average. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's a trend line for medium-term uh, stock price appreciation. And, and if it, if those indices move clearly below that line, it means we're in a medium-term downtrend. And so unless we can see a rebound and recapture of that 150-day moving average in very short order, like in the next few trading days, I'm afraid that a downtrend will be established for the summer. So uh, there's a, these are very... Uh, important times, uh, days for the Canadian market. 
And um, if it can regain its footing and recapture that 150-day trend line, uh, and uh, your listeners can can get the Canadian Insider Index, uh, which is a mid-cap or an index in real time on CanadianInsider.com. Uh, if we can recapture the 150-day moving average, then we have a chance at you know uh, reestablishing an uptrend. But right now, it's going to be a real challenge to do that. Well, uh, going back a month and a half ago, a month ago, people said the setup really looked like you should sell in May and go away. And that would have been the right advice. Well, you know, it's been a volatile period. Now it's come clear is that the Federal Reserve uh, is moving from being data dependent. We, you know, we heard this for years since the financial crisis. Oh, that we're only going to move when we see the data move in the right direction. Well, now the data doesn't seem to matter as much. It's more mission dependent, and it looks like the Federal Reserve is determined to try and push up interest rates to a more normal level. Well, and this is all fine and dandy, but uh, unfortunately, they've probably left it a bit too late. And but we'll have to see how this plays out. The bond market in the U.S., the yields are still fairly low. They're still towards the bottom end of their recent range. They're not all that impressed with the Fed tightening uh, its monetary conditions at this point. Uh, there's nothing unusual about um, the bond market behaving that way in a tightening, but it just goes to show you that it looks like we may be heading into a traditional period where the Fed is going to may, may very well tighten the U.S. into a recession. Uh, the question is how how fast do they do that if that's the case? So we'll, we'll have to keep an eye on things. The Canadian market very sensitive to to global uh, economic developments, and it's not liking what it's seeing right now. Um, but we can. We'll have to see the next few days. I mean, China seems to be doing okay, uh, but uh, you know, the, if China's doing okay and the U.S. starts to slow, that's still not a a clear uh, victory for for um, equity investors. You have to see how that mix plays out, and I think that's what in, uh, markets are just trying to sort out right now. Is um, you know, will will the U.S. be able to avoid a recession? Uh, with the Fed uh, normalizing its interest rates in, in, in the fall, uh, likely starting to uh, uh, shrink its balance sheet a little bit. So th- there's a lot to digest over the next few days. I expect we're going to see some volatile trading conditions, but it, w- it would be nice for long investors to see uh, the NK Insider Index and the S&P TSX Composite both get back above their 150-day moving averages, but both those indices have their work cut out for them to do that. We'll have more with Ted Dixon right after this. I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain's Brunswick property is located in the Rideout Shear Zone in Ontario. With grab samples running as high as 32 grams per tonne gold, a drill program will commence this spring to test the numerous targets located by recent groundwork. For more information, visit our website, rmroyalty.com. Keep informed. Receive our weekly recap of thought-provoking articles, podcasts, and radio delivered to your inbox for free. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage, HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're chatting with Ted Dixon. Ted, a few days ago, President Trump gave Janet Yellen, the Fed head, his vote of confidence. It seems to me he also did the same thing for his FBI director. He he does have to make a decision that... Uh, fairly soon, who will be the uh, head of the Federal Reserve, and that that will be uh, very interesting uh, to watch. Uh, we'll, ha- we'll just have to see uh, what comes out of that uh, process, and I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to guess uh, forecast any uh, decision that uh, the U.S. president's making. You know, uh, first of all, I don't think uh, there's a lot of I don't think there's a lot to be gained by even if you do get his calls right. <laughs> and secondly, I'm not sure that. Uh, there's a there's a way to a- accurately forecast uh, what he's going to do on a consistent basis. Is it a good thing for Canadian former prime ministers to be touring the U.S. trying to chat up NAFTA? Well, I think uh, we have to be very engaged in the NAFTA process, you know. And look, it wouldn't surprise me, by the way, that uh, Canada got a bit of a nudge during this NAFTA renegotiation about our currency. You know, this sudden change of tune by the Bank of Canada... I think it was probably driven by the fact that they, it was just becoming so ridiculous to hear them talk about how bad things were. But it wouldn't surprise me if the U.S. you know finally noticing, hey, you know, what are you guys doing driving down your currency when your economy is actually doing better than ours? What's going on? 
And so it wouldn't surprise me that there has been a bit of a nudge uh, from the Americans for the Bank of Canada to get its act together and start, um, you know, uh, at least uh, at least uh, moving in the same basic direction as the Federal Reserve and trying to normalize interest rates as opposed to trying to, you know, drive down the Canadian dollar for the benefit of a few exporters. You know, so it wouldn't surprise me. I don't know that. I'm, I'm speculating, but. Uh, uh, you know, put two and two together. We have NAFTA negotiations coming up. We have a U.S. administration that's highly uh, uh, focused on currency differentials. Wouldn't surprise me if uh, somebody got a tap on the shoulder saying, "You guys want a decent NAFTA shot at getting a good deal? You better do something about your currency because we don't like it." And uh, you know, and that's too bad that it would have taken foreign intervention, you know, to to actually do the right thing for Canadians, and that is. Uh, allow the Canadian dollar to at least uh, better reflect uh, our true underlying uh, fundamentals, which aren't nearly as bad as the Bank of Canada has been uh, been spouting out for the past uh, number of years. The private debt-to-income ratio has gone down very slightly. Is that a good sign, or, or do you think it's just a blip and it's going to continue to rise? Well, that is uh, one of the... Uh, uh, weaknesses of the Canadian fundamentals. You know, I've talked a lot about the positives, only because you don't hear about the positives very much in the media. It's all bad stuff. You know, uh, it's all how, how horrible Canada's doing. But uh, look, for sure, one of the big problems we have, the elephant in the room, the big problem is uh, private debt. You know, I hear Andrew Scheer, the, the new conservative leader, going on and on about public debt. You know, so Andrew, you're on the wrong train. I hate to tell you this. But uh, it's actually household debt that's the big problem in this country, and it's a, you know it's a debt that ballooned under the previous government. It's a debt that's you know not going away under the current government. But you know you've got um, you've got an opposition that's focused you know strictly on the government sector. But the real uh, risk here is the debt being held by individual households. And, you know, that's going to be the biggest challenge for the Bank of Canada trying to normalize interest rates. Well, I normalize, you raise interest rates. I, I, I believe that they go into a, a normal course when I see it. But, uh, you know, th- there's going to be repercussions uh, if, uh, you know, if they do start raising rates to try and keep up with the Americans and uh, you, to get, you know, interest rates back to a normal level because they've left the Bank of Canada has left interest rates too low for too long. They're the ones who've been the prime drivers of this, of this surge in household debt. They, they always talk about it's Canadians taking on too much debt. Well, you know, if you're running a happy hour for four years, 24 hours a day, and you're the only bar in town, you know, uh, don't tell me you're surprised if you find out that uh, some of the local villagers uh, have a drinking problem. You know, it's, you know, there's, the Bank of Canada has a lot of responsibility for what's happened here, and it would be nice if the Conservative Party and Andrew Scheer, you know, got their heads around it. But, you know, at this point, I don't think we have to um, accuse uh, the new Conservative leader of uh, overanalyzing any uh, any uh, policy issue, and, you know, for, you know, in that respect, at least uh, uh, he won't be at a disadvantage uh, to the Liberal uh, Prime Minister, who, you know, has never been accused of that either. So, you know, we're going to you know we're just going to have to suffer through this as Canadians with second rate uh policy making um out of Ottawa we've had that now for the last couple of years and uh you know the certainly the US uh there was a lot of hope that Trump would uh, make some breakthroughs on um uh regulation and tax reform but uh so far that's all missing in action as well for the most part there's been some token moves so you know, it's really up to the economies of Canada and the U.S. to work it out on their own, to, for people uh, to use their own ingenuity to, uh, you know, build a better life in Canada and to deal with the obstacles that we have. And, and big debts are, are a tough one. But, you know, Canada Canadians have a, a really good track record of, um, you know, paying off their mortgages and uh, living up to their obligations. However, that track record is going to be put to the test because we've never been confronted with this type of mountain mountain of uh, of debts that uh, you know households own so it's going to be challenging times uh, i have more confidence in canadians than i do in the central bank i just hope the central bank uh, you know doesn't uh, uh, make things uh, even worse uh, you know as 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 we go down the road here they you know they really got the central bank really has its work cut out for it given given the debt pile that it's helped to create 
Ted, thank you so much for chatting with us. Uh, thanks very much, Jim. My guest has been Ted Dixon, CEO and co-founder of InkResearch.ca, his website, CanadianInsider.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our popular YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Questions for the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.